On the set of the Italian film Two Women, Sophia Loren had some valuable jewelry stolen from her dressing room and she emerged from her dressing room a little later and she was crying and she was upset. The movie director, Vittorio De Sica, took her to one side and said, listen to me, Sophia, I am very much older than you and there is one great truth I have learned about life and it is this, never cry over anything that cannot cry over you. What a great piece of wisdom, right? What a great lesson to learn because what's the underlying message here? Only people can cry. So obviously only people are worth crying over. People are more important than things. We know this, this isn't groundbreaking, but we need to be reminded of it because we forget it. The truth is we worry and cry about so many different things, but people are more important than houses, more important than furniture, more important than cars, more important than any of your possessions, more important than any material thing. And the Bible makes it clear that people are very important to God. So if people are more important than things, and they're more important to God, then shouldn't they be more important to us? Last week we talked about spiritual maturity. And we said one of the markers of a mature person is of someone who can recognize the world around them. That they should be aware of other people and consider the feelings of other people, maybe even put other people first. Jesus wasn't self-centered. He was very outward focused. And as Christians, we are called to be like Jesus. So when we look at the example of Jesus, he always went toward the people. He went toward the mess, not away from it. And I get it, people are messy and the mess typically scares us, but the mess didn't scare Jesus. In fact, it was the mess of their lives, right? It was their mess that brought Jesus to them. And I know as Christians, we're all trying to be good people, we're trying to be nice Christians, that's good. But my argument is nice isn't good enough. To be like Jesus means we need to be plugged into the people around us. We need to be doing church together. We need to be doing life together. When you attend one of our members classes, we go over what church fellowship is. And we do that because in churches, not just our church, but any church, we throw that word around a lot. We'll say, join us after for fellowship, right? Or we'll say, the potluck's gonna be a great opportunity for fellowship. Do you know why we have Bible studies and potlucks and men's ministries and women's groups? Because that's the goal. The goal should always be fellowship. Church is group. We work best as a group. There's no such thing as the Lone Ranger Christian. There are no independent Christians. We are called to be a collective, to support, to encourage one another. And the Bible uses all kinds of imagery to describe the church as a collective. We are part of a body, we are part of a flock, a kingdom, a building, a household, an army, an assembly, a priesthood. They're all collective terms. And they are the reason that we fellowship together. And that's to work out our faith, yes, but it's also to impact our community together, impact our world together. Christians are supposed to be more than just nice. We're supposed to be compassionate. How would you describe Jesus? Would you describe Jesus as being nice? <laughs> I wouldn't. I can think of several stories where he wasn't very nice but he was compassionate. And compassion goes beyond our walls, beyond our church, beyond our property. We need to extend the fellowship, extend the compassion to everyone, even to the people who are not like us, even, Jesus says, to people who are our enemies. First John says, beloved, let us love one another for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, 
Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. You know, on my car dashboard right now, on yours, right? There's a gas gauge and a speedometer. I look at one more than the other. Do you know how often I've been pulled over for speeding? Maybe four or five times. But do you know how often I've ever run out of gas? Never. John says, God has given you a gauge to measure how much you love God. And he says, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. That's his gauge. John says, if you want to know how much I love God, look at the gauge. Look at how much I love other people. The great evangelist Dwight Moody, he used to tell this story of a little street boy in Chicago. He would get up each Sunday and walk to Moody's church for many miles. The little boy would pass church after church, pass Sunday school after Sunday school in order to get to the church where Moody pastored. And one morning, someone stopped the little boy and said, where are you going? And the boy said, I'm going to Mr. Moody's Sunday school. The person said, that's many, many blocks from here and it's freezing cold. Come into our church, attend our Sunday school instead. The little boy said, no. But the person persisted and finally asked the little boy why he walked so far across the city just to attend Mr. Moody's Sunday school. And the little boy's answer was short and simple. He said, because they love me over there. You may have noticed that there is a culture war going on right now about love and acceptance. It's very heated, but underneath it all, I think you'll agree that people are just asking to be loved. We all want to be loved. We all want to be accepted. And when I watch Jesus, he always loved first and preached second. You know, we talked about the woman caught in adultery and after her accusers left, once she was safe, once she had Jesus' trust, then that's when he said, go and sin no more. Yes, please live a life of faith, live a life of integrity, but we should be preaching love. And did you notice how First John, that passage that we read, how it ended? He says, no one has ever seen God. And I really think the word but needs to be here. When I read this passage in my head, I insert the word but. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. In other words, nobody has ever seen God and the world is asking you, prove God exists, prove there's a God. And so the way that happens is when we love one another. Last week, we read the great commandment. Jesus said to love God and love our neighbor. There's a similar passage in Luke where a Pharisee gives the same answer. So it's not just a command from Jesus. We inherently know this. This is how we should live. We should love God. We should love others. Luke 10, behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Who are these biblical teachers of the law? Well, in the first century, you had scribes, you had Pharisees. They were, they were separate groups, typically, though there are some scribes who were also Pharisees. They're lawyers. Their knowledge of the law was so great that they would draft legal documents for the Jews. So a marriage contract or a divorce contract or a loan or inheritance or a mortgage or if you were going to sell your property. So these teachers of the law, they're very smart guys. Experts in the law of Moses. Their role was to make sure that the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, were correctly interpreted. And so they should always have an answer. If you have a question about the law, they should know how to answer it. So the question this lawyer asks Jesus is a loaded question because he already knows the answer. That's why in verse 25, we read that he wanted to test Jesus. But Jesus is also very smart. <laughs> 
And he knew this was a loaded question. And Jesus is the master of the question boomerang. Okay? Jesus gets asked a question, and he'll just throw a question right back at you. In verse 26, Jesus says, what does the law of Moses say? Today, you and I, we would probably say it like this. You read and study the law every day. That's your job. You should know the answer. You tell me what it says. And just as expected, the lawyer gives a good and credible answer. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. This is the great commandment. It's a perfect summary of the Ten Commandments. Love God with everything. That summarizes the first four commandments. That's an upward relationship, all of our dealings with God. And then, love your neighbor as yourself. This summarizes the other six commandments. This is the across ways relationship that we have with others. It's also a mashup of Deuteronomy 6.5 and Leviticus 19.18. Jesus says to the expert at the law, good job. <laughs> you answered your own question. But Jesus adds one more thing. He says, do this, right? He says, do this and live. Don't miss those two little words because the problem for this lawyer is knowledge. He knows the information. We know this because he knew the answer to his own question. Christians, we know a lot of information, don't we? We know a lot of Bible stories. The lawyer's problem is not lack of knowledge. Us, Christians, our problem is not lack of knowledge. Jesus knows the problem that this lawyer has. Execution. In fact, all the Bible stories about Jesus and his interactions with the scribes and the Pharisees, they had nothing to do with their knowledge of the Bible. What upset Jesus the most about his adversaries was their motivation to practice what they preached. He was not mad at them for their knowledge of the law. He was not mad at them for their academic study. He wasn't mad that they were all professional Bible students. They would spend hours sharpening their arguments, clarifying their points, talking uh, to other people and getting all their right answers. But head knowledge only goes so far. Head knowledge is only academic. Jesus wants them to apply the law on their hearts so that it comes out in their actions. These men, these leaders, it, they, were, they were like students who never left college. Jesus wanted them to get their noses out of the books and get out there in their communities. So he tells this lawyer, love God and love others is the right answer. Now go out and do it. Sir Francis Bacon, was an English philosopher, statesman, scientist, author, and lawyer. He said, it is not what men eat, but what they digest that makes them strong. Not what we gain, but what we save that makes us rich. Not what we read, but what we remember that makes us smart. And not what we preach, but what we practice that makes us like Christ. You can memorize the bus schedule from your bedroom but that will never get you anywhere. To paraphrase Jesus' answer to the lawyer, he speaks to us in 2023. He says, you already know the answers. Now, put it into practice. I think Jesus would have made a great chess player. You can see these moves, these back and forths in the story. The expert in the law, moves out his piece with a loaded question. Jesus moves his piece and exposes this man's flawed question and actually returns with his own question. And when this expert gives the correct answer, Jesus then calls check. And he goes from theory to practical. And he says, do it and you will live. Ah! He's got the lawyer on the ropes. The man's sweat is pouring over his brow and he doesn't want to admit defeat. He thinks... I got one move left. He doesn't want to face the crowd defeated. So this expert of the law, this Old Testament lawyer, he did what all lawyers do so well. 
he looks for a loophole in the law. And he thinks, ah, I think I found one with the word neighbor. So he moves his bishop, avoids check, and says, ah, who is my neighbor? And whoosh, Jesus already has the question boomerang ready. Jesus begins to teach us all a story. Very popular story, perhaps a story that we could all tell from memory. The parable of the Good Samaritan. And it's especially important for us because it is a story about compassion. Luke 10, the lawyer desiring to justify himself says to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down the road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound him up, poured on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to the inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think, prove to be a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? The lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Jesus picks a setting for his story that was very well known for danger. The journey from Jericho to Jerusalem was very steep, very treacherous, because it was a place that robbers could hide in amongst the rocks and caves. In fact, it was such a dangerous road, it was often referred to as the Red Way, or the Way of Blood. And to those who were listening to the story, getting beat up on that road would have been very believable, because it was a common occurrence. The story begins with a man getting beat up, and Jesus just calls him a man, some guy, right? Trans some translations say a certain man. Today we'd probably just say, some dude, some person, a nobody. He's not described. He's not named because he could be anyone. And that's the best way for Jesus' story to begin because it reminds us that this is not about one person or one specific group of people. This is all people. All people are important. I'm sure this priest or this Levite would have helped a fellow priest if they saw a fellow priest injured. I'm sure this priest or this Levite would have helped a family member. If they had seen their family member injured, they would have stopped to help. I'm sure this priest or this Levite would have helped someone that they knew. If they saw that person and said, I know that person, they would have helped them. But the tragedy of this story is the two men that walked by saw the injured man as no one. A need was seen, a human life, a person who needed help. That person was somebody's uncle, someone's father, someone's son was laying in the road. But because he was not one of us, he became an inconvenience to a busy day and therefore both passed him by. Why does Jesus expressly make the first two encounters with religious men? to speak to us, to speak to the lawyer, that no amount of Bible study or knowledge or insight or right answers are gonna help this man on the road. The only thing that'll help this neighbor who has been left for dead is compassion. And compassion is based off of need, not worth. Both of these religious leaders saw the injured man, but they ignored the need. They both had a comfort level that dictated their actions, and they couldn't be bothered. I'm too busy right now. I'm not equipped for this. I'm not ready to help someone. I'm sure somebody else will help him. But, like we pointed out, if this were a fellow Levite, or a fellow priest, or a family member, or a friend, they would have stopped. So let's be honest. Compassion has nothing to do with busyness. 
or readiness. The truth is we walk by the need and we say, this isn't worth my time. Jesus then says, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. The Samaritan has pity. He has compassion. He feels something. I think because we know the story so well, we miss the impact of these words. It would have been shocking to the hearers who heard the story from Jesus' lips. You see, you and I, we have changed the meaning of the word Samaritan over time. Now, when we say, oh, a good Samaritan stopped to help, what we mean is a helpful, friendly person took time out of their busy schedule to do the right thing. But when Jesus tells the story, the words good and Samaritan were far apart. They were opposites. It would be, it would be like me telling you the story of the honest thief or the faithful adulterer. Samaritans were hated. The listeners to the story probably expected the Samaritan to finish the guy off, to kill him. The hatred between Jews and Samaritans had gone on for hundreds of years. It's still working itself out in what we see with Israel and Palestine. This passage says, but when he saw him, he had compassion. And the Greek word here for pity and compassion is very vivid. It comes from the word that refers to your intestines or your, your bowels. In other words, you get moved in your deepest parts. His gut told him to help. When the Samaritan saw the dying man lying in agony beside the road, something real stirred within him that was too impossible to ignore. It would have been impossible for him to pass by without helping. This wounded man's plight troubled him. And he knew, if I pass this guy by and I don't do anything, I'm not going to be able to sleep tonight. I wonder when was the last time that you and I were moved like that, that we felt so stirred by compassion to do something. But Jesus, his point is compassion does something. Compassion does something. What does he do? He went to him, bandaged his wounds, poured oil and wine on him. Then he put the man on his own donkey and brought him to an inn to take care of him. The Samaritan does not pass by on the other side. In fact, he's moved toward the mess. He doesn't run away from the mess. He moves toward the mess. Are you a mess? Yeah. Am I a mess? Yes. Just like we said a few weeks ago. Our mess doesn't scare Jesus. It's the reason why he came. If it doesn't scare Jesus, it shouldn't scare us. In order to build relationships, in order to have fellowship, we need to move closer to the mess of others. Building relationships with others does not just magically happen. Jesus demonstrates compassion. In his story, the Samaritan does six action things, six action items. He went to him. He bandaged his wounds. He poured oil and wine on his wounds. He put him on his donkey. He brought him to an inn. He took care of him. Six practical things that any of his listeners and anyone here could do. Jesus spells out compassion in action. Demonstrating compassion is not complicated, but it does cost something, right? Compassion always costs something. The next day he took out two denarii and gave him to the innkeeper, look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. The Samaritan put him on his own donkey, which means, of course, that now the Samaritan has to walk. So he could be personally inconvenienced. He patches him up on the side of the road. He could have left him there, but he didn't. So he walks the extra mile because he has to take this man to an inn. Not only does he take him to an inn, but then he pays the innkeeper to look after his needs. So he's also financially inconvenienced. He left money to take care of this man's needs. And he said, there's no limit, right? He didn't place a limit on it. He said, there's no limit. I don't think there is anything this Samaritan 
could have done to show him more compassion. Compassion cost him something, didn't it? And if we're honest this morning, the reason why most of us don't get involved is that we don't want to pay that price. Involvement with people eats into your time, it eats into your finances, it eats into your plans, and it's messy. When we see a messy person, we know deep down we are supposed to go and do likewise. But when we see a messy person, it usually just brings a whole bunch of questions to the surface. You say, how do I meet that need? Where would I even begin? When is the right time to do this? Do I even have the right resources to do this? Do I want to get involved? Who really is my neighbor? Why don't we move towards the mess? When we see the need on the side of the road, what makes us hesitate? Three things. It's not convenient. That's number one, isn't it? It's not convenient. We're all busy. We're so busy, in fact, we don't have any room for messy people. And we become irritated when they step into our lives. After dinner, if somebody walks up to you and says, hey, buddy, do you got a dollar? I need something to eat. And you think to yourself, ugh, can't they see that I'm busy? The priest and the Levite, I'm sure we're both busy. In their heads, in their world, they were worried about keeping it all together. And when they saw this beaten man, they couldn't stop because they hadn't built any room into their life. How do you know if you're too busy to show compassion? Well, I guess you're too busy when you see a messy person as an inconvenience instead of an opportunity. Second reason, it's not comfortable, right? It's inconvenient and it's not comfortable. And let's be honest, we spend our lives trying to make our lives as comfortable as possible. We're trying to make life more comfortable, not less. But there's a problem with being too comfortable. Being too comfortable leads to boredom, and it leads to inactivity. But Jesus never calls us to live a comfortable life. Second Timothy says, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Jesus Christ will be persecuted. John 15, Jesus says, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. First John says, do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. No one's going to hate you (laughs) when you live a life of seclusion and boredom and comfort. Listen, we will never be the best version of ourselves while we stand inside our comfort zone. Third reason, We can't control it. Sometimes when we see a mess, I know exactly how to make this right. So we step in to control the situation. But people don't like to be fixed because people are not projects. But what happens when you move toward the mess? What happens when you take a chance? You show compassion, even though it's inconvenient, even though it's not comfortable, even though you can't control it, what happens when you do it anyway? Someone receives healing. That's what happened for the man on the side of the road. And you know what? Even right now, if you're listening to my voice and you are not a Christian, you are not a follower, Helping others is still a win, isn't it? We know it is. Moving toward the mess is a great way to flex your compassion muscle. And look, when you begin to love your neighbor as yourself, you're following Jesus. At Walden Church, we have several ways that we step toward the mess. We have Stephen ministers. These are men and women who have taken some classes and some instruction to learn how to be a good listener, to ask the right questions, to sit down with someone whose life is messy and to help them find a way out. We have grief share. Again, 
people who are walking through a dark period in their life where they miss someone, they feel the loss of someone in their life, and we have grief counselors who want to sit and help them get through this time in their life. And I know I'm going to sound like a broken record, but we need help in Sunday school. We need help in our Sunday school classes. You can be an influence in the life of a child. You can help that child be a person who grows up and avoids getting into a mess. I know it's not convenient to teach Sunday school. I know it's not comfortable to teach Sunday school. And let's face it, we can't control kids. But we need people to step up in this department or we're going to have a really hard time bringing this program back. You could also lead a Bible study. Lead a small group in your home. You don't have to wait for me to start a Bible study. You don't have to wait for me to lead one. You're a member of our church. Grab some other couples and have a Bible study that begins to meet in your house. And I know another excuse we might give is, well, I'm really trying to wait until I get my act together first. No, you don't. That's the excuse that we always give. But we all know that God uses messy people to love messy people. And yes, it's going to be inconvenient. It's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to get out of control. But go and do likewise. What would it look like? I mean, just think. What would it look like, friends, if the global church all decided to be the Good Samaritan? It would be a game changer for thousands of people who would receive compassion. And it would be a game changer for us because compassion demonstrates faith. Jesus says, which of these three do you think was neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And the lawyer says, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. And if you listen carefully enough, you can almost hear the lawyer choke on his own answer, right? He can't even bring himself to say the word Samaritan. So he says, the one who had mercy on him. And for the second time, Jesus tells this man to do something, first time he says, do this and you will live. The second time he says, go and do likewise. Once again, Jesus has turned this man's question around. At the start of the story, he asks, who is my neighbor? And at the end of the story, the question is, what kind of neighbor am I? Checkmate. Somebody once said that having faith in Jesus Christ, claiming to be a Christian, is like throwing a pebble into a pond. You can't throw it in without creating ripples that spread out and touch the rest of the water. If there are no ripples, is there any evidence that there was a pebble in the first place? I was raised on... Charlie Brown and the Peanuts cartoons. My dad had several of these books, and I read one where Linus is having an argument with his sister about becoming a doctor, and she says, you can't become a doctor. You don't love mankind. Linus says, I love mankind. It's people that I can't stand. Jesus' parable tells us to do this, to get closer to the messes of others, not to pass by on the other side, to show compassion to my neighbor, to love my neighbor, whoever he or she might be. Let's pray together. Lord, right now our prayer is for your church, your global church in every country, in every state, in every city, in every borough, in every neighborhood, every church that meets in homes, that there would be a revival of love amongst your people, that the worry would not be Bible studies or head knowledge, but showing acts of compassion, moving out of the building into the community, showing grace and forgiveness and love to their neighbor. 
Lord, we pray that Christians turn their reputation around from being finger pointers to being huggers, lovers, people who extend grace and mercy, people whose hands and feet bring good news. Lord, right now, it seems like your church has such a bad reputation for all the wrong reasons. Your son did not come to condemn. He came to love and to heal. Yes, we will always teach the truth. Yes, we will not back down from what is true and what is right. But first, let our lips be sweet with the love of Jesus. May we truly learn what it means to love our neighbor as ourself. No matter who lies in the street, no matter what mess is before us, that we would even go so far as to love our enemy. May your church be people of love. Amen. That's what a church should be, a family, a place that shows love and acceptance. Of course, a place of truth and a place that does not back down, a place that teaches the authoritative word of God 100%. But first, love, right? We are called to love one another. The answer that is given, the perfect answer, is that you and I spend our lives loving God and loving others. That was the first and greatest commandment. It is the summary of all the commandments. Love God. Love each other. We do that together, corporately, as a church. You cannot be a church from home. You need to be with other people. You need to be shaking hands, hugging, and loving the other people. And I get it. If your life is a mess right now, and you don't feel like you could, you could be welcomed into church, you're embarrassed, don't be. Every single one of us is an embarrassment. Every single one of us is a mess too. Your mess is welcome at Walden Church. You are not an embarrassment at Walden Church. At Walden Church, we want to be the church. Not just to each other, but to you. We have two services on Sunday. One at 9.30. That's a traditional service. It's going to feel like the church that you grew up in. We have a choir, we do responsive readings, we say the Lord's Prayer. And then we have an 11 o'clock service that is a contemporary service. We have a worship team, our songs are a little bit more modern, and you can come casual, come as you are. It's also a great time to bring your kids. We've got a children's program from birth all the way through high school. Let us be the church where you live so that you can church where you live. I'll see you guys Sunday.